Sasha has changed quite dramatically, and unexpectedly too. Nobody expected that uh, we will be where we are now, not in foreign policy, not the confrontation with the West, um, and not the changes domestically. Um, Compared to um, what it was like um, up until just a couple of years ago, Russia's become more conservative, more authoritarian, more isolationist, more ideological. Uh, and uh, these changes originate uh, not with the uh, events in uh, Crimea and Ukraine. Uh, rather, those changes originate a bit earlier with Putin's comeback to the Kremlin in 2012. Um, and were precipitated and deepened quite significantly, quite dramatically by the developments in Ukraine. Now, why uh, um, those changes began uh, with Putin's comeback? I would say three reasons. Um, one is economic. Uh, the way um, uh, Putin's Kremlin built its relations with the society was uh, ensuring broad acquiescence uh, by delivering to people or uh, if we're, you are more cynical, uh, you can say buying the acquiescence. And indeed, it was quite a successful project. Thanks to the high and growing price of oil, the government was able to deliver. People responded with very broad acquiescence, the modernized and the conservative alike. Um, however, um, while the oil prices still remained fairly high, um, the uh, economic growth began to decline the economic model of amassing the oil revenues and distributing them was failing Russia. It was no longer working as effectively as it used to. Uh, and Putin knew he would uh, no longer be able to buy acquiescence. The second cause is mass protests that started in 2011. And again, this was before uh, there was any deterioration of the economic standards. And actually, at that point, the oil price stood quite high. Uh, the government continued to deliver. Uh, it delivered opportunity for those who sought to fulfill themselves. So um, it looked like the, the government was still delivering what, uh, what it used to. But um, beginning in December 2011, uh, we started having mass protests in the streets of Moscow and other uh, big urban centers. Not an economic protest at all, rather a protest against Putin and against the system that looked to people corrupt and unfair. Um, the most common line during those protests was Russia without Putin. And even though it was just 100,000 people in the streets, uh, not too many, I mean 100,000 in Moscow, um, doesn't look like a major challenge to, uh, the, uh, to, to Putin's government. Still, it looked like a challenge to Putin's legitimacy the legitimacy that he had enjoyed for, for a decade. There was a clear decline in the legitimacy. So again, there was 100,000 people in the street maximum, uh, but about a third of the Russian population in public opinion surveys supported the line, Russia without Putin. We're talking now late 2011 and 2012. So two causes, the government was um, um, faced the need to improve terrain's legitimacy and to do something with the economy because it was uh, um, on the climb. And the third cause was uh, the events in Libya, that to Putin was a last drop that the West cannot be trusted. Russia abstained in the uh, UN Security Council, thus enabling the West uh, to ensure in a fly zone. But in Putin's view, the West, uh, first and foremost, the United States, abused uh, this uh, concession and uh, we know what happened in Libya. So to Putin and to those around him who had always said the West is the enemy and should be treated thus, this was a last drop. So these three, um, when Putin came back, um, already generated a climate that was uh, quite different from uh, the previous four years of the British presidency and even the years of Putin's presidency before that. Um, first, um, how do you raise the legitimacy if you can no longer buy it? Um, but uh, Putin's, uh, um, Putin's mode was to substitute ideology, conservative ideology, uh, for um, economic deliveries. Um, that was the time when Putin started talking about the West not just as a force that uh, always seeks to do damage to Russia, 
but also as a morally decadent force condemning the West for abandoning the European values, uh, for uh, its uh, tolerance policy that he referred to as, uh, as barren, um, and for the policy of multiculturalism. So moral condemnation of the West was in the line. Uh, the Kremlin had to um, just oppose something to the, um, to the protests. If those Russians, and that was the Kremlin line, were bad Russians, unpatriotic Russians, then there was a need to send a message to the nation of what good patriotic Russians stood for. So the ideological pride. Um, also, um, um, since um, the economic decline uh, was inevitable, uh, the government was facing a dilemma. What do you do? Liberalize, unleash people's energies, or something else. Because uh, unleashing uh, people's energies and liberalizing ran totally counter to Putin's strategic priority of control. So he opted for a crackdown, for uh, harder centralization, for um, harder involvement of the uh, government and the economy. Uh, and uh, the Libya, uh, of course, was, uh, um, was the reason um, of um, increasing confrontation with the West. So, uh, fast forward to uh, uh, um, events in Ukraine. By then, I want to em emphasize, we already had a different Russia, a quite a uh, tangible turn in the Russian uh, foreign and domestic policy. And of course, the events in Ukraine precipitated and deepened it. Um, what happened was the, uh, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, the totally unexpected uh, um, escape of President Yanukovych from Ukraine to Putin was uh, a major defeat. Uh, what's more, he was thrown back to square one, back 10 years earlier to the Orange Revolution when uh, uh, Kiev had a pro-Western government. So suddenly another pro-Western government, an anti-Russian government in Ukraine, and uh, uh, a vision, a specter of NATO, naval base, uh, um, being deployed in uh, Crimea and uh, the city of Sebastopol. So Putin had to act fast, and what he did was, I would argue, the most dramatic move in Putin's 15-year tenure, the annexation of Crimea, uh, whose consequences he probably expected, but uh, accepted the costs, or maybe he did not expect just to what extent this move was unacceptable to the West. So since then, we have a major precipitation of all the trends that uh, uh, had already taken shape before that. And of course, the fact that uh, um, uh, the annexation of Crimea was followed by sanctions, then of course the uh, crash of uh, uh, the Malaysian jet, and then they were in the bus. Things getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, what uh, it did to Putin, actually, was fulfill one of his goals, and this is to reinstate legitimacy. Uh, the problem that he was trying to solve, but didn't quite solve in 2012 and 2013, he solved with the annexation of Crimea. Uh, the Russian people responded to this with an upsurge of patriotism, of rallying behind the flag, of this over 80%, way over 80% approval <coughs> rating for Putin, and uh, a, a very broad national consensus based on basically two pillars. First is uh, rallying around Putin as the commander of a besieged fortress, and B, the loathing of the West. And both enjoy broadest public support in Russia. The loathing of the West has new colors to it because uh, the anti-American sentiments have been around up and up and down for a long time, but the European Union enjoyed much better perception in Russia. Um, so, um, as uh, Vesla mentioned, uh, it turned out that people were not so focused on the economy because the combination of the economic decline, of the sanctions, of the, of course, the drop of the oil price uh, have taken a heavy toll on the Russian economy and uh, people's living standards, and people are aware of it. But it turns out that the old um, 
uh, President Clinton's uh, maxim, it's the economy stupid, does not quite work in Russia, that's why. It turns out that it's not just the economy stupid. Despite the decline of the living standards, the illegitimacy is quite high, looks fairly solid, and uh, uh, whatever happens in the future, you know, things have gotten very unpredictable in Russia. Um, at least at this point in time, the illegitimacy is reinstated. The economy is not in great shape, to say the least. Um, and I will probably stop here. Thanks. Um, I will ask one more short question. Can you say whether uh, the murder of Boris uh, Benzov was some kind of a threshold? Was it a changing moment for the atmosphere in, in Russia? Um, I'm sorry to say um, that it was not. Um, of course, this came as a shock, and arguably, maybe also to President Putin. Um, the assassination of Nemtsov is uh, a political assassination that, up until now, has no explanation. Who and why wanted him dead? Uh, this sounds very cynical, but with previous political assassinations, we knew who might want those people dead. Um, for instance, maybe the most prominent case of the assassination of Anna Politkovskaya, uh, Russia's prominent human rights advocate and journalist, um, he was, she was seen as the personal enemy of Ramzan Kadyrov, the uh, it's, it's very intimidating and brutal figure, the leader of Chechnya. He said so many times, he threatened her. Uh, uh, she was uh, subjected to very rough treatment in Chechnya earlier. So, well, it can be suggested, especially given that uh, Ramzan Kadyrov is a kind of leader in whose tenure many of his enemies and adversaries somehow mirac miraculously got murdered in various parts of the world. Moscow, Chechnya, uh, the Arab Emirates, Austria, so he has a record, even though, of course, uh, we don't have any evidence, we don't, we don't have any proof. One person who dared suggest that uh, Ramzan Kadyrov bears responsibility uh, was immediately sued by Kadyrov. So, but in those cases, uh, we more or less knew who might want, who saw those people as their adversaries. In this particular case, we don't know. Um, of course, everyone who is arrested on charges of um, um, social assassination are from Chechnya. Kadyrov behaved rather in a rather strange fashion afterwards. A very uh, strong effect that we saw was the uh, inner strife among the Russian elites, and especially between um, Ramzan Kadyrov, the leader of Chechnya, and uh, um, uh, members of the Russian um, security elites. It came to the fore. That was a very strong effect, uh, and actually something that <coughs> did not happen, certainly not to this degree. But to say that it has shaken the society, I wouldn't say so. Uh, indeed, 50,000 people took part in the funeral rally, in the funeral march, after the result of assassination. Um, liberal rallies had not gathered so many people for a rather long time. But uh, if anybody expected or still is still expecting that this would uh, rally people together, that this would, this shock would energize the Russian um, protest community, or I think political opposition is an overstatement. Um, this has not happened. I think that this community is, um, remains demoralized, remains intimidated, uh, and uh, is fully at the mercy of, uh, of the Kremlin disease.